Fun fact of the day about your friendly neighborhood snack. I love gaming in all its forms, including mechanical ones. I grew up in a household of pinball fanatics, and I was no exception. In fact, one of the games I could get all my family members to play with me was a pinball game that I had on the Super Nintendo, and I've loved the game ever since. And speaking of games I've loved, and in this case also hated at times, it turns out that a particular Pokemon game I've missed out on all these years actually was a pinball title to itself. And since this month's month, I decided I wanted to do a bit of a, shall we say, loose interpretation of a theme of spin-offs here, I decided to sit down and give it a try. How does it hold up? How did it age? Find out here. Join me for a closer look at the Pokemon pinball titles. Greetings everyone, this is the Hipster Snack, and at long last, I'm going to review a Pokemon game. Seems a bit overdue given the Mons Month theming and all that, but as said, we're all about spin-offs this month, so we'll be looking at the two Pokemon pinball titles. The first released on Game Boy Color in 1999, hitting the English-speaking world for the first time in summer, and introduced the core concept. It's pinball, but the ball is also a Pokeball and the boards are themed for the red and blue versions of the core games, having different layouts and gimmicks, with some key mechanics shared between the two. But let's do the breakdown first before we get into mechanical. Graphically, it's decent. I'm not particularly nostalgic for that Game Boy slash Game Boy Color era of games. I feel that style went the way of the Dodo for good reason. But the graphical work here gets the job done and takes advantage of the color schemes that the GBC could produce, so good job all around. This is also one of the first portable games I can think of that maintained a rumble functionality, which honestly just seems a little silly to me if we're being honest. Anyway, the music is pretty good. What actually surprised me was, while playing, I heard a particular melody that I knew was familiar but couldn't place where it came from. After a little searching on YouTube, I discovered the song in question was an instrumental remix of the original Japanese theme song from the Pokemon anime, which Near as I know is one of the few instances where the anime bled back into its source material. So nice touch, I guess. I didn't notice a similar version for the US original opening, but hey, whatever. Sound effects are decent, just muted boops and bips when the ball taps something or you use your flippers. And speaking of, let's break down the mechanical side of the game at last. For starters, there's two major issues and I just can't go on without addressing them. First, it absolutely does not feel like I'm playing pinball. The play area is too narrow and confined, it doesn't feel like it would be a real table. By the way, there's only two tables, they both suffer this, and I'd argue that red is overall the superior table because blue feels like too much of a cluster of waste and futility. Honestly, I'd argue it's borderline unplayable thanks to a particular compass pointing arrow that can throw the ball random directions from sources unseen. And I get asking a Game Boy to emulate realistic pinball physics is a stretch, but it absolutely does not handle like it would be a real pinball even in the slightest. Every bump of the flipper feels like the game is just guessing, approximating where the ball ought to go as a result. And again, these tables are narrow and they're cluttered, so getting anywhere is no small feat. And this is complaint too, the upper and lower halves of the table exist in different screen spaces and the game does not scroll. So instead we get this NES style screen wide out to transition, and depending on the trajectory of the ball this can happen rapid fire and it very quickly becomes nauseating to look at. So in addition to not feeling or being designed like pinball, it also doesn't look like pinball either. And maybe one might argue that this was all deliberate, to make it more Pokemon and make it less pinball, and that might be a fair argument. The game does introduce some unique mechanics that only the Pokemon theming would allow for. For example, when you fill up these slot things, by the way, once highlighted, the flippers can move these dots around so you get used to the feel behind them, you can do this rapidly in an ideal scenario. The Pokeball will advance to a great and subsequently ultra and master ball form. These serve as bonus multipliers in their own right. And once you fill this energy gauge thing by using the ramps and outside pass enough, then slotting the ball in a starting point, you engage catch mode. See, at the start of play each session, a slot reel determines the environment the board's staged in, in relation to this mechanic. Because once you enter catch mode, you'll have a board appear front and center, with a silhouette of a Pokémon themed to the environmental type from that aforementioned reel. Then, you need to shoot the ball into the bumpers on the board, and hit them repeatedly in order to reveal one-sixth of the Pokémon's image with each tap. So six bumps later, and a Pokémon spawns on the board. 
You then need to bonk it with the ball a few times and you'll catch it. The game maintains an ongoing Pokedex which updates between play sessions, so your progress is saved in this regard as you move along. Then, under different circumstances, you can also activate Evolution Mode, which is similar enough in concept for you to sink the ball into a particular goal in the form of six or seven possible target areas, and you'll need to tag at least three. Upon doing so, you can then select a Pokémon to evolve to their next state, and also get that Pokédex entry as a result. However, to do this, it must be a Pokémon that you caught during the current play session. So, no backtracking on this one. Because the game only has two tables, this is where the bulk of the gameplay hours will ultimately come from, as it is entirely possible to get all the original 151 Pokémon in this fashion. However, this isn't all there is to the gameplay experience. There's also many games which can randomly queue up. Or it certainly seemed random to me, I really can't tell you. The one I would get a lot more than any other one was this one where Meowth would casually stroll around and if I bonked him with the ball, he dropped some coins, which I would then get points for if ever I bumped the ball against them. But really beyond that, that was about the full sum of my time spent in the game. Also, and this bears mentioning, the flippers are controlled with the A button and the left input on the control pad. And on its face, that doesn't sound so bad, but here's the thing. To shake the table, you use up and down on the control pad. You know how hard it is to routinely tap the left flipper without ever accidentally pressing the neighboring directions on the Game Boy control pad? Thankfully, I never tilted, but there were a lot of accidental shakes because of this. Also, as an aside, the Pokeball is markedly larger than a traditional pinball. And yet, there were still times when the ball would take certain curves and then zip between the paddles, completely ignoring any and all input from the player and force a loss. Paradoxically, there were also times where, with a little crab claw action, I could glitch the paddles through the ball and recover it from a position where that just shouldn't have been possible. This is... Alright, I'm just gonna say it, this is pretty bad. It doesn't feel like, look like, or work like pinball. Instead, what it is is grindy RNG that happens to have elements that make it look like a pinball table. Ultimately, it's a clunky game that fails at being either a Pokemon game or a pinball game, and that's where this review was originally going to end, but then I noticed a certain something while I was researching it. Turns out, there was a sequel on the Game Boy Advance, Pokemon Pinball Ruby and Sapphire, debuting in August of 2003. With the hardware upgrades came some much-needed fixes, like smooth scrolling, wider tables with more interesting minigame events, and shaking the table is now assigned to the L and R buttons instead, making the key controls much more intuitive. The boards are much wider this time and have much more interesting gimmicks, and frankly, simply make more sense from a pinball standpoint. In addition to the capture and evolution modes, which function more or less in identical fashion as the first games, the game also adds the new mechanic of egg hatching, where shooting the ball into an incubator will cause an egg to hatch after enough passes through, then a Pokémon will wander onto the board at random. Tapping them enough times with the ball counts as an additional catch, which is a nice touch and a fair enough way of incorporating a new mainline series mechanic in a way that's intuitive and self-explanatory, and doesn't just copy the original catch mechanic beat for beat. Also, the minigames in this game are great. Like this crazy one I had where I was squaring off in a pinball battle against Kyogre, and he's trying to freeze my ball and I have to mash the flippers like a madman to break out of it, and I repeatedly batter it with a non-stop assault, hitting it when I can dodge its whirlpools and freezing wave. This is good stuff. Or how about this one? I got this one a few times where dust skulls float around and I have to bat them with the ball, and then a giant boss Dusclops comes out to have a go at me but he blocks direct attacks from the front, so I have to bank it off the sides to hit him in the back or sides. This is really intuitive use of the pinball mechanics in a Pokemon theme. I found myself completely changing gears because here's the best part. It finally feels like I'm playing a pinball game. Obviously, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one recreation of physical feeling of pinball, but it's so much closer that any discrepancies can be chalked up to simply being video game abstractions. Well, I was basically disappointed that there were only two boards, Ruby and Sapphire, and the boards are somewhat mechanically similar, I did find myself really enjoying it just because the game was good. It also helped that one of my first catches in the entire game was Vibrava, which then evolved into Flygon on the same playthrough, which is my favorite Pokémon, so maybe the game was also bribing me along the way for a good review. But even so, I was genuinely enjoying this version. I played far longer than I needed to for the sake of this review because I was actually having fun. 
Game feel is one of those things that can be difficult to explain, but the difference between the first game and this one is night and day. The gameplay is much faster and vastly more engaging. There's more to do and more to see, and even though it does rely a lot on the repetition and RNG, especially given there's only two boards and the theme is set like a slot machine again, the game does help a bit with that, as there's now a travel mode where you can re-spin the reel to determine your location anew without losing and starting over. Or you could do what most Pokemon fans do, just get the ones you want, play more pinball than Pokemon, and enjoy that it's a more relaxed experience instead of trying to get all 386 Pokemon available in this version. Not like you can battle or trade them anyway, right? Overall, Ruby and Sapphire is a huge step up, and if you want a fun, simple, but engaging pinball experience, I actually recommend this one, vastly more so than its predecessor. And that's the final word on the Pokemon pinball titles. Would I want to see a third installment? Hmm, sure, but I would certainly hope that they make it a point to add more than just two boards and a handful of gimmicks. How about a series-long compilation with two boards per generation with interesting gimmicks and themes dedicated to each? Uh, I can dream. This has been the Pinball Snack. If you liked today's episode, be sure to tap the like button so I know. Leave a comment down below. Did you play these games before now? Did I make you interested in them? Are you a pinball wizard too? And for more like this each week, including NDX, Snack Tech, and Season 2 of the Tomodachi Bros. Review podcast, hit the subscribe button so you'll never miss a one. Join me here five days a week for more like this, and I will see you there.